Okay, we're gonna take a little walk around the orchard garden today. There's some fruit trees planted in here and some vegetables planted in between. First thing you see when you come in is this lovely moonflower. They're a wild native flower here. They just happen to grow here. And this one being by the gate, I wasn't gonna weed it out, I was gonna leave it because it's a nice way to be greeted. So, okay, so first thing that's interesting in this garden is these beans here. Notice they're gonna climb, they're climbing up the fence here. These are called tepberry beans. Totally different species than the garden beans that we used to grow, like the bush beans or the pole beans, whatever. Totally different. This is native to this part of the world, to the southwest United States. This was a traditional staple crop of indigenous people who lived here before. It really likes hot weather. It doesn't want too much water. And uh, it's hard to find the seed these days. I got this from Native Seed Search in Tucson and I'm growing this out, you know, to increase the seed. But this is the kind of plant that would probably be able to grow here um, without any supplemental irrigation, which is, you know, what would be really, that'd be really awesome because things here need so much water otherwise. But yeah, this one, I guess if you water it too much, it uh, gets all leaves and doesn't even produce any beans. So that tells you something about that. Now here's the bean trellis. You kind of see the end way down there. It's about 60 feet long. There's another, another view of it. So, starting on this side, we've got purple pole beans, Violetto Trianvo, which is an Italian heirloom. These are especially favored for freezing because they turn green when you cook them. So yeah, a lot of vegetables, when you freeze them, you cook them first to stop the growth, check the growth as it's called. And so you have to time that. And these are like a, a built-in timer because they turn from purple to green when they're ready. So you'd slice those up, steam them for like whatever that is, two minutes, put them in bags, put them in the freezer. And yeah, these just started producing a couple days ago but they're really taking off now. This is really when they're perfect to pick. Notice how they're just starting to have um, a little bit of a bumpiness to them. Before that, when they're flatter, they haven't quite developed enough. This is when the full flavor is. And they go past this and actually aren't as good anymore. So it's the sort of thing you want to pick every day. I know, look at this. These, here's another species of bean. Again, it's different. These are yard long beans, also called asparagus beans. These are native to Southeast Asia. Now the beans that we usually eat, the, or most commonly eat, the pole beans and the bush beans, this and that, those are from Central America. So this is from Southeast Asia. This is very popular in a lot of different Asian cuisines. And yeah, they're fun to grow because they get really long. I mean, I've had them get at least 24 inches long. I've never seen them actually get a yard long, but I don't know, these are doing really well. They like this weather, maybe they will here. This part of the trellis is some Romano, which is some flat green pole beans. And I don't see any on here yet. They're slower. Some flowers and whatnot. No, no beans yet to show you on there. More basil tucked in in between the beans just because I had a whole bunch to know where to put it all. More of the yard long beans. And then down here, these are more pole beans. This is a yellow one called Necker Gold. This is from an Italian seed company called Franchi. Oh, there's a teeny, teeny, teeny little baby one there. These will turn yellow. So we'll have purple, yellow, and green. Green beans, as they say. And in between and on the other side, there's a bunch of bush beans down here. And look at those big fatties down there. Yeah, see, that's a Romano type flat bean right there. And these are not for eating right now. These are for the, these are for dried beans. These are cannellinis, which, you know, a lot of people think is the very best uh, dry bean, the very best soup bean for flavor. It really is good. So yeah, I'm growing a lot of them here because they're expensive to buy and they're delicious. And it's fun to grow beans. And what the heck is this in the middle of the bean patch? 
Look at this enormous plant. This is a volunteer. Some people would call this a weed. This is a native plant in the area. Here's the flower on it. Look at that gorgeous, gorgeous flower. This plant is called Devil's Claw. Let's see if we can show you why it's called Devil's Claw. Indeed we can. So, look at this. This is the fruiting body that it makes. This dries out and becomes this, I mean, it already looks like a claw, but it becomes even more of a claw when it's dried out. So there's a whole bunch of these forming down here. And these were used, uh, these had different uses for sure, I think in crafts mostly, for the people who lived here before. Uh, Nikki was really interested in having some of this around this year. And when this one volunteered, I just let it go. I'm definitely losing some beans for how big this plant is. I mean, this is an enormous plant. It's like five feet across at this point. Uh, there's some other ones on the property I can show you if, I, if we run into them that are much smaller. This is what happens when you irrigate them. So this is the other side of the bean trellis. And now you'll see that what we've got here along the fence of the orchard garden is a long tomato patch right here. And there's three kinds of tomatoes growing here, like there were in the kitchen annex garden, along the fence, on the fence itself. And getting ready to climb this tall trellis that I just built for it, are more of the orange currant tomatoes. There you can see more of those down in there. It's really going to be producing a boatload here at some point. Look how many there are here. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the flood. And then at this end, Starting here, we've got Romas. Yeah, can you see the Romas in there? See, they've got the little pointy fruits on them. So yeah, Roma. Roma tomatoes are the best for sun drying because they're not as juicy and they're more mealy. And I'm really interested, so is Nikki, in having a bunch of sun-dried tomatoes this year. So, there's a bunch of them here, and I am having a problem in this garden with tomatoes getting munched like this when they're close to the ground, and I haven't figured out who that is yet, who's munching things. Don't know who that is. Is that a squirrel? Is it a mouse? I don't know. It seems too big for a bug. Yeah, so I haven't figured that out. But it only seems to be happening to the lower ones. Then you see there's an orange flag here in the patch, and that means after this, now, if the Romas stop, and it's more of the Zeus cherry tomatoes. Here's some getting ready here. Look at that, Mag. Isn't that great? I'm going to get a bunch of seed. And this prickly poppy, this is a native flower that happened to volunteer in the middle of the tomato patch just before I put all the starts in, and I left it because look at these flowers. Just a gorgeous plant. This is medicinal, too. It's not an opium poppy. That's a different genus. This might have similar attributes or uses, but isn't an opiate, technically. Here is a native plant that I let go, right in the middle of the garden in between some of the beds because it's so pretty. You could call this a wild form hollyhock, if you'd like to. The genus is Sphere alsea, which is round alsea, which is round mallow. Alsea is, just by itself, is the genus of the hollyhock like you might have in your garden. Here we've got a Tulsi bed. Tulsi, 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 Tulsi Basil, Akamam Sanctum. It's from India. It's an adaptogen. It's really, really, really delicious as a beverage tea. And it's really awesome as medicine. And there's some more pesto basils stuck at the end of there. And volunteering all over at this, at this time of year during the monsoons is this amaranth pigweed. These leaves are edible. I've been letting it go so far. We'll decide which ones to take out later, but that's a great weed to have, one that you can live off of. Because you can eat the seeds too, of course. Here's the potato patch. The potato patch had got attacked by some beetles earlier this year. That was unfortunate. So you'll notice that in the rows here, there's some breaks, you know? Plant, 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 plant. Oh, no plants, no plants, no plants. Oh, back to plants. No plants, no plants, back to plants, yeah. All the no plants places are where the beetles came in and decimated it. Now these were some pretty deep trenches that I had these planted in 
and uh, it's just like a week ago maybe that I filled them in most of the way to start hilling these potatoes up. So the pads that I'm walking on now will eventually become trenches as the soil gets, um, you know, heaped up on the potatoes because they make more if you do that. Now there's also this going on. That's a hole in the ground where there was a potato plant. Who's doing that? I don't know, but I think skunk. There are skunks that live on this property and in this garden. And I did see them digging in this potato patch in the other garden once. So I think that might be what's happening here. Cause see, that was a plant. Oh, see, here's something that's being dug, right? They're coming in from the side there. Yep, yep, yeah, that might be the skunks. I don't think there's particularly anything I can do about that. And then, Back here in the shade, along the irrigation ditch. Oh, there's some cows. You might notice some straw here, and there's a whole bunch of mint, and marshmallow, and grapes. These are grape seedlings I started this year. These are for some, from some really delicious purple eating grapes that I picked off of an island in Clear Lake in Northern California. It's an island that's a park that has a bunch of grapes going on. And there's some chocolate mint. I got all these going by doing clones. Propagation by cuttings. I'll put up a picture of that. I did that in the hoop house this spring. Did a bunch of cuttings because I really like mint tea, especially in this hot weather. And then this is marshmallow off the African Alice related to the sphere I'll say uh, that we just looked at over there. They're in the same family. And this might look like a creek. And I guess for all practical purposes, it is a creek. But it's actually a human-made and probably man-made um, irrigation ditch. So if you look past the cows there and see the line of cottonwood trees there, I don't know how far that is, maybe half a mile? That's where the Gila River Valley is. And then off of the Gila River, they make these irrigation ditches, like this one. And then there's ways of... of uh, irrigating these pastures from these ditches. They flood the pastures from these ditches. So yeah, this irrigation ditch has been here for about 100 years. The series of laws around water rights here uh, are are that, that old too, over 100 years old. The water rights are that old for a lot of places here. This particular piece of property does not have water rights to this. So it's technically illegal for me to even go and take a cup of water out of that. But the trees that are growing along here they can put their roots in there, allowed. Snuggles. There's some cows. So yeah, you don't really want to go swimming in this either because it's full of cow manure and cow piss and it's kind of gross. So yeah, I was hoping that the grapes would do well under here, but I wasn't sure that they were going to. Then I saw this. This is a wild grape. So, obviously, this is a good spot to plant grapes, because look, here's a wild grape growing here without irrigation. So yeah, what I'm going to do, or what the plan is, with the gra with grapes here, is to make just enough of a trellis here to climb them up the fence and into this tree, this walnut tree. Just let the grapes grow up into the trees. Because around here, uh, from, what, uh, from what I've heard from the locals, grapes need to be grown in the shade. It's too hot for them in the full sun. So I thought, okay, let's put them here by this tree and then let's give them enough help to just get up in there. Will that make it hard to get some of the fruit at some point? Yeah, but there'll be some low and you know, that's some for the birds and whatnot. And you know, 